Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host and founder of Alzheimer's Speaks, Lori LeBay. And for those of you that are new to our show, I just want to give you a little background about Alzheimer's Speaks, what it is and how it got started. Um, basically, my mom was uh, having issues with dementia for over 30 years. And so it really changed my life. And I changed careers and I've I've become what I call a steroid on advocate or a, an advocate on steroids now for the disease. And so Alzheimer's Speaks was created as an advocacy based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort around the world. And we're about connecting the dots and helping people find resources and raising voice of all involved. We believe by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday conversations about life with dementia that we're going to be able to remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help people live with purpose. Everybody deserves that. And together, we can help um, the world understand the true needs of this disease. We can remove the myths. We can remove the stigmas um, that create the fear and isolation that are so devastating for those diagnosed, their family, friends, and um, the community around them. At Alzheimer's Speaks, we believe collaboratively we are going to win this battle against dementia. And I know the power of collaboration is working because of all your likes, all your shares to your Google um, circles, to your Facebook friends, to your LinkedIn colleagues, um, through your listservs. You have been sharing our resources at Alzheimer's Speaks, and we were um, just thrilled to be notified that we were the number one influencer online for Alzheimer's, according to ShareCare, which is the largest health and wellness uh, website in the world, and Dr. Oz. Um, I would really appreciate any continued support you have. Um, it's simple to do while you're listening. If you're listening through your computer, um, you know, like this show, share it, um, tweet it out, um, whatever modes you have. It just takes a second. It doesn't cost you anything, but it's about the power of knowledge and the more information we can have out there for people when they're in need the faster we're going to be able to shift our dementia care culture and really bring peace to people and purpose back into their lives. We also on this show um, really encourage people to call in with any questions or comments they have. And the call-in number is 714-364-4757. Again, that's 714 714- Three six four four seven five seven. Um, or if you are, again, using your computer, you can always communicate with us through the chat box. I will be monitoring that uh, throughout the show. Um, and so let me go ahead and before I introduce our, our guest today, I always like to give a shout out to certain organizations that I think are just critical that so many people still don't know about. Um, the first one I want to mention is Alzheimer's Disease International. This is an organization of all the Alzheimer's associations around the world. So no matter where you're located, um, Alzheimer's Disease International can help hook you up not only with the nearest location to you, but with a global view and research um, and great data. So check out Alzheimer's Disease International. You'll also hear them referred to as ADI. 
Um, if you're in Minnesota, like I am, I highly recommend Health Star Home Health. They are absolutely fabulous. And I have dealt with a lot of home health agencies um, over the years, but these guys have actually taken the time to get their staff trained uh, through a program called the Alzheimer's Whisper. And not only do their staff um, have this information, but they share their knowledge with their families. And um, they're just doing some really cool progressive things, um, helping people get resources and information regarding Alzheimer's disease and dementia. If you're one of those that likes a more holistic approach, check out Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. There you're going to find things on food and, uh, you know, your diet and exercise, meditation. Um, they also have some free educational programs uh, that you might might be interested in as well. And then many people are dealing with specific types of dementia. There are a lot of different types, but uh, Lewy body dementia and frontal temporal uh, dementia are two that kind of stand out after Alzheimer's. You're, you hear more about them. And each of those uh, there have associations. And so I would encourage you to go and check out the Lewy Body Dementia Association as well as the Association for Frontal Temporal Degeneration. Um, and many people also have issues with speech. And there's a group called the National Aphasia Association, and that's A-P-H-A-S-I-A. And they will give you a lot of great tips um, regarding speech and communication. Last, I just want to wind up with um, some more social connecting aspects um, that I think are really helpful. I am a huge believer in the power of music, and I don't know if any of you watched uh last night on TV, the, the Stevie Wonder special, but it was fabulous. And it just brought me back to a whole, whole other zone there with music. And Alzheimer's Music Connect can also do that for you. They have wonderful, wonderful music to help people engage. In fact, they have a patent pending um, with their music. And you can't tell it by listening, but it helps people engage with dementia up to three hours after listening to it. So it's, it's pretty cool pretty powerful. And then puzzle with me. A lot of people like to do puzzles and work on fine motor skills. Um, Jane Snyder has um, built some beautiful puzzles that are fewer pieces, so they're easier to uh, to complete, um, more age-appropriate, and bigger in size, so they're easier to handle um, as our fingers don't work the way they used to um, with age. And then Jiminy Wicket, of course, is just a, a fabulous, fun um, game of croquet that is adaptable for people to use um, it, as families, as uh, communities. Uh, it can even be used for education. He brings up, Jim Creasy brings this uh, program into the schools where he teaches kids about um, Alzheimer's and dementia and then matches them up a lot of times with a memory care where they play one-on-one. -on -one. So some just fun resources that I, I think are important for people people to know about. Let me go ahead and introduce our guest here today. Um, I am thrilled to have Carrie Mills with us, and um, she is, uh, she's been recognized in the field of Alzheimer's care um, for quite a while. She has been a regional manager for a pioneering Alzheimer's healthcare organization where she served for eight years. Her goal then and now is really to change the perception of dementia in the public square, you know, um, and I, I'm so on base with that. Uh, we really need to get that um, uh, perspective shifted. Um, Carrie has witnessed uh, so many successful stories firsthand, and she knows how much despair and anguish um, families can encounter, but it can also be overcome through education and training. And so her heart is really solid in that platform. As a founder and the president of Engaging Alzheimer's LLC, she's had many opportunities to share her expertise and her vision here in the United States as well as in Canada, the United Kingdom, Hong Kong, and China. And most recently, she uh, co-authored a book called I Care, 
which is a handbook for care partners of people with dementia. Um, Carrie is a regular guest on uh, several local radio stations and has completed an interview on PBS, the News Hour, with uh, host Paul Solom. So welcome, Carrie. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. Thanks for having me, Lori. I'm um I love what you're doing. Your whole introduction is so absolutely perfect to describe you and what you do. But I'm delighted <laughs> well, to be here. <laughs> well good. It's um it, it's very fun doing these. I, I just uh I think it's so important for people to know the resources that are available today and that was, you know, uh, what made me do this is it was one of the things that I struggled with personally and I'm sure you see it all the time with families and friends uh, of people who are dealing with dementia is, you know, where do we find the support and the resources? And and they're not always right in our backyard, and they don't have to be. Right. Um, but right. for whatever reason, we have that um, we have that perception that it needs to be in mm-hmm. our backyard. And social media has just opened up a whole a whole new world of connection and knowledge, which is which has been really really very fun. Um, mm, Carrie, before, before before I get started with um, some of the questions I had outlined here, can you just share with our audience, ha- have you had anybody in your family or a close uh, family friend uh, be diagnosed with dementia? It's always interesting for our audience to kind of know that. Actually, I haven't. Um, my my um, both of my parents are they're you know they're young they're in their sixties and um, neither one of them have a diagnosis. None of my grandparents, none of my aunts and uncles. I had one grandmother that uh, great grandmother that lived with us in in her late eighties. She became a little bit um, a little bit forgetful, but nothing compared to you know kind of what we see these days. So. Yeah, I actually, um, I've never been affected by this in a personal sense. Um, just just the hundreds of people that I've loved and cared for, I've lived the journey with them. Okay. Well, I just, uh, it's always interesting because some people have a real, you know, personal connection like, like myself and yeah. and others, you know, not Um but it's they've still been touched in a significant way um that they want to make a difference in our in our pulling things um fast and furious together you know to to help people and speaking of yeah. pulling things together can you tell me what motivated you to write the book i care um sure so i um so in in all of my years of doing this work i was in my early 20s when i started and um so, you know, in your early 20s, you're invincible, the world is on your side, you can make it what you want to be, sort of that mentality. And so my, um, what kind of springboarded me, um, not so much for the book, but this perspective was I was an activity assistant in a nursing home, and my job, of course, is to make sure people had fun, right? That's the whole, that's the, the mm-hmm. basis. If you're not doing that, we, we need to reconsider. And so I saw the huge difference that it made in people's lives when they had purpose, when they were working towards something, when they um, were given the opportunity, when people expected them, that they could do something. And it made such a huge difference in their life that it, it's probably been my number one motivator in working with this population since. And so a number of years ago, I, um, I people started saying to me, you know, you, you need to write a book. Like everything that you say, everything that you – the way that you think it's kind of just not the norm and and so the reality is right there's there's reality and then there's everybody's perspective about it and our perspective is actually what has for oftentimes has a huge a, a greater bearing on how we how we move forward or how we think about things or how we react to things more so than maybe the situation itself so you see people that have a horrible diagnosis of cancer and are the happiest people you've ever met, or you you meet people that get a hangnail and they're miserable for four days. So it's kind of like at the end of the day, I said, well, because a lot of people will argue and say, oh, that's not possible and everything that you said is too hard. And I said, okay, but it's just my perspective because I've lived it. Like I've lived Mm -hmm. it for 12 years and I've seen this hope and this, I've, I've had many families that have said like, you know, if it wasn't for this disease and, and my perspective, my mom, my mom, my relationship with my mom never would have been what it was, you know. And so because people had been saying that for some time, I thought, okay, well, maybe, hey, if people want it, then I might as well look into it. And Jennifer Brooks, the woman I co-authored it with, she and I were working on a project together in Canada, and she just 
like got it the same way. I mean, she, we were like two peas in a pod. And yet her her background is entirely different. She's a speech pathologist. She's involved in tons of research and stuff. And people had been saying the same thing to her. And so what we did was we said, okay, let's see if there's validity to what, you know, people are asking us to do. And so as we went out and we really did our due diligence and research to see what was out there, what we really saw was that there's this camp of very good medical that really um, – can explain the details of what's going on. And then there's a handful of books that have some more practical tips and aspects. And then there's other books that are kind of memoirs and people's stories, which are, you know, always great, provided that the person understood the right way to do this in the end, right? And so we said, you know, the one thing that we don't have, though, is really a, a book that brings all of that together. You know, the um, we said, you know, we we want we recognize that if people understand why these things are happening, they're they're more willing to accept it. Like I can handle, you know, my mom repeating the same thing for the hundredth time. If I understand that part of her brain is completely broken, and therefore when she does that one more time, I can say, you know what, mom, here's the answer. I got to go to the bathroom, and then go give yourself a ten minute break because your mom isn't in the same position as you would if you just couldn't remember those things. Or, um, you know, if people understood, it's not that your husband's lying to you. Your husband doesn't remember the details exactly like they went down. And so when he comes home and says, look, somebody rear-ended me again in the parking lot, and you then find out that he, in fact, hit somebody else, the natural reaction for the spouse is to say, he's lying to me. Why is he trying to cover this up? And so when people understand, well, there's just damage in his brain that made him not under, not recall the situation the same, then they don't have to be as frustrated. They don't have to feel as though somebody betrayed them or lied to them. And so so we felt that this edu- the education part was such a critical component because it's really what allows us to think different, right? There's always people who say you have to be patient, you have to just understand. But how can you be those things if you don't, if you don't have any basis for it. And so so that's why that was our motivation. We said we want to educate them. We want to give them the tools. We want it to be in this really easy to grab, read, read three pages and, and go apply that and not worry about everything you don't know, um, while at the same time we were offering hope and success for them and success stories that went with it so that they were sort of able to feel like we were giving them a hug every time they were reading the book. So that was kind of our motivation behind it. Oh, that's that's nice. And I, I like that you wrote it where you can pick it up and put it down and not feel guilty, you know, about not sitting down and reading the whole thing, you know, line by line by line, but really being able to use it as um, a resource. And, um, and you know, it's, it's, it's easy to find. You have so many great tips um, in here, and uh, you, you've just done a, a wonderful, wonderful job with it. And um, I think people will find it extremely, extremely beneficial. Can you tell us, um, you know, you refer to care partners, and uh, I don't think our, all of our audience probably understands what what a care partner is and why the verbiage is important. Um, sure. So, um, so right now, most people who are providing care, looking out for somebody, sort of taking on part of the responsibility of somebody else's life who has dementia, gets grouped into what we would all know as a caregiver. And so the challenge with that is that their entire purpose then in that relationship becomes about them giving. And so with that, if I'm constantly giving, I, I get tired, I might get resentful, I might have anger at times, and then, of course, I have guilt that I have all of those feelings. And that's just normal. That would be normal if I was doing that to my sister, constantly giving, and I never was kind of given anything in return. It, it's it's understood in pretty much all of our relationships. And so the term caregiver, in in a sense, says that's pretty much what's going to happen for you because the title is saying that there's not really room for you to receive and that there's no room for the other person to be able to give. Their their job is to receive and yours is to give. And so by changing the verbiage to care partner, what it's doing is every time we say it, it's constantly reminding us that this is a partnership. This is not a person with dementia. Most of the frustration that somebody who gives them care runs into is that they're trying to control to some degree, whether it's a circumstance, whether it's the person as a whole, whether it's that person's diet, their medications, when they go outside, 
the more that they're trying to control the person, the person who's trying to do the controlling usually is the one who ends up very frustrated because people with dementia, just like myself, don't respond well to somebody trying to control them. And so when you're a caregiver, in essence, that's your job because it's to provide and take care of um, with not really expecting something in return. So when we, when we instead look at this as a partnership, a partnership allows both to give and it allows both people to receive. And if you look oftentimes, a person with dementia, you know, if, if a husband is, you know, now doing the dishes and trying to do all that stuff that maybe he's never done before in his life and his wife may walk over and say, oh, I'll, I'll do this. He says, no, you go sit down. I, ha- I have this. I do this. You know, and so he's taking the role that she's always had. Maybe she can't do it the way that she used to, but maybe she can still participate to some degree or that her, her husband would be able to see, oh, you know what, at least she wants to, to help eliminate some of that resentment that sometimes they might just feel like they're doing so much and it's never really appreciated. And so this, this idea of partnership allows both people to be contributing to the relationship, albeit a different contribution than maybe it's been in their past, but it allows it, the, the verbiage kind of reminds the person who's giving the care that this, this is equal. There's give and take here. And so in the same way that I'm giving, it's okay for me to receive. It's okay for me to have days that are really good. It's okay for me to mess up because that's what happens in relationships. It's okay for, for me to laugh when they're being really funny. It's okay for me to just love them like crazy for no reason um, without that feeling of, just being weighed down by all those other things. And so that's kind of why we're why we've introduced this term to really say we need to look at this different because the reality is that so many of the dementias that people are going to deal with will more fall into the chronic state than they will a disease that's going to have this quick impact on somebody. And so with that it means you've got to learn to live with the disease. It's not something that's going to end next week for most people. So in doing so, the person who's providing the care needs to take care of themselves. And so in, in recognizing that their role isn't just about giving, that there's a lot that needs to be received there, it will help them to sort of have that balance in their life that they need as they go through this this process. Yeah, it's it's very important um, uh, term, and it's one that you know I still flip and flop back and forth because a lot of times people don't know <laughs> know what it means. So I yeah. still when I'm when I'm hashtagging things, we'll still put caregiver or caregiving out there, and it uh, you know yeah. kind of puts a little knot in my stomach every time I do it because um, it, that perception of give and take. Um, you know, or just giving yourself away and not getting anything in return is just so wrong because in, mm-hmm. you know, at the core of any relationship, it, you know, it's it's two ways. It, it's impossible yeah. for it not to be a two-way um, relationship. Even if somebody's lying there in a coma, um, yeah. you know, people don't have to use words. There's still something that's being exchanged between us, nonverbal, energy-wise, um, on a heart level, so many different levels. And it's it's important for us not to lose sight of that because, you know, to me, that's what juices us. You know, that that's mm-hmm. kind of our plug in to get charged is um, getting filled back up. And when we feel that that doesn't exist, I think we get drained um, mm-hmm. and we get weary really, really fast um, yes. with that. Um, so thank you for, for kind of defining yeah. that for us. Um, in your practice, you know, what's the greatest challenges, uh, you know, that you see families facing these days? Um, I think some of it is what you were saying earlier on the call, um, you know, that they're they're looking for resources, and, they and of course, we all want them to be close. Um, I think right now with in healthcare, there's a lot of really good movements that are taking place to provide other things, if you will, for people who have dementia. So, you know, a lot of people are familiar with the Alzheimer Cafe, or if you're familiar with Artists for Alzheimer's, or um, the different museum programs. So they're they're kind of these opportunities to to have access to just regular life. Even, but they've mm-hmm. been modified for the needs of a person who has dementia. And so um, that said, they're not in every community. And so it is really hard for some people because what they really want is 
to be able to just kind of have that life. They want to be able to go to dinner with their friends, but their husband is somebody who's at great risk for choking. And so going out to dinner just isn't really isn't the best option for him, right? And so, but if there's a, a time and a place where they can get together and meet other friends where if the husband starts choking at dinner, it's okay because the wife can do what, what needs to get done the way she would at home and nobody else is going to be shocked by it, then it creates this, a different environment for people. So I think one of the challenges that people definitely has is, is trying to just become comfortable in what these new resources might be if they are accessible. Um, I think one of the main things that people are still um, dealing with and, and have been for, for quite some time is sort of accepting that this is what it is um, and not immediately getting depressed about it. So a couple of weeks ago I was speaking with the, the wife of a gentleman who had just been diagnosed and I had spoken with her a couple of times just in passing before his diagnosis. And so she came to me a couple of days after the diagnosis and she was just crying and she was so upset and she said, I can't believe it, you know, that everything's horrible, life's just changed. And I said, so let's just take a step back. Last week when I talked to you, you were doing fine. You were managing everything. You were on top of everything. The end of the week, you got hit between the eyes with a brick, which was the diagnosis. But nothing has actually changed. Like, you're still going to be able to keep doing the things you're doing. He's going to do the things he's doing. And so we need to prepare for what tomorrow holds, we need to get our advanced directives in place and have some of those, you know, difficult conversations. We need to um, make sure that the finances are in the, the proper name and, and things like that so that we can can manage that when the time comes. But but to all of a sudden rush to, you know, they're going to be in a, in a nursing home and they're going to be wearing Depends and, you know, they're not going to get good care. It, it's a false illusion that it's a false reality because, there's many people where that is not the reality of the end of the disease process for them. And so I think the main thing that people struggle with is sort of the stigma and the perception of what will be rather than just living in what today brings you. Um, There are many people that I have cared for that this disease was not what ended up taking them from this world. They, they had a heart attack. They got a diagnosis of some sort of cancer. They, um, you know, they, they fell, they ended up getting pneumonia, you know? So there's this, um, this fear of what will be and this sadness of what will be robs them from what they could be having today. And so I think that as families are able to then say, okay, so this is what it is today while there's sadness and there's grief and there's mourning there's still so much that's happening that if I can if I can get my perspective shifted to just enjoy this time now, then I've actually gained. And so I say to families often, you know, you are going to be on this journey once, maybe twice, at the most, maybe three times in your life, right? Maybe a mom, an aunt, a grandmother, a sibling. And so you you're you've got to give yourself the freedom to just live through it and not just try to get to the end because once you once the journey's over, it's gone. They're gone. And so um, it kind of all morphs itself together that it, it brings the person back to having to focus on what does today offer you? Don't worry about mm-hmm. tomorrow. Don't worry about whether or not, you know, you're going to get into the right nursing home or the right assisted living or, you know, look at it, look at the situation today. You know, you as a care partner, do you – do you need a break and do you need them to have a better life because you can't bring them the best of what today has to offer? You know, is there a day program available? Is there, you know, a companion agency that, you know, can take your husband to the vet's association when they have their meeting and let him live in his glory with the other veterans, right? So um, the, the, the thing that's challenging is that people say, well, but they can't do that or they might not be able to in the future, but if today they can still do it, then it's worth putting the effort forth to get it in place today because today might be the only day that you have. And so kind of that perspective of not worrying about the future but planning for it but then trying to keep yourself living today I think is one of the the biggest things that um, families really struggle with. Yeah, I I totally, totally agree with that. I I think, um, you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in our grief and our loss because life isn't what we thought it was going to be and it's so easy to worry about you know projecting what's going to come down the pike 
um, which, you know, I laugh because, I mean, I get trapped in that, too, and we do it not just with dementia, but we do it with all kinds of stuff because it's all about control. You know, this we, we think yeah. living is, is yeah. about control, and and you will live more um, freely and, I think, enjoy more when you let go of control. Anyways, that's what I've found personally for myself, um, which has been pretty amazing, um, the gift of letting go of control. And then I, uh, I sometimes sit back and chuckle thinking, all the stuff I've worried about that's never happened, the, the waste mm-hmm. of time that I have spent. Mm-hmm. You know, because time is so precious, and I think you know, once a, a chronic illness hits, or an Ill, you know, uh, something traumatic happens, we realize how precious time is, and yeah. um, you know, where do you really want to focus is is so important. And and don't mm-hmm. you find that you know, as families adjust, um, simplicity plays a big role in terms of of happiness i mean it, it's not the big stuff we're wishing for right right oh yeah you know? yeah i i couldn't agree with you more in fact it's funny that the things now that kids will say you know the children of a person who's diagnosed you know i just love it that my dad can be at the soccer game with my kids you know that was just something i always wanted and it's like you know, or I was just excited that dad could still be with us for Thanksgiving or that, you know, mom was able to, you know, come to my granddaughter, go to her granddaughter's party or, you know, that, um, you know, he started sleeping through the night. That was a huge benefit. So, it's yeah, oftentimes they're not these grandiose things. But I, I sort of liken it to when we're going to go on vacation. You think of yourself at work and you're getting ready to go away for a week. And all of a sudden, that week before, there's this need to accomplish everything that you've never accomplished in, like, mm-hmm. the last year. But now that you're going away on vacation, it's like you want to wipe your slate clean. And obviously, it never happens. And so you put all this pressure on yourself to try to accomplish something that's really unrealistic. And mm-hmm. the reality is you go away, and for the first day or two, you can't unwind. And then you begin to. And when you come back, that stuff that seems so important that you were frustrated you couldn't get done, it's like not important. It, it took its proper place yet again. And so I think there's an element of that where, especially spouses, and for all the right reasons, they want the best for this person that they've loved for so long and they want to do really well in this role. But I think sometimes they put so much more pressure on themselves that mm-hmm. – it makes it hard for them to do what they've just kind of always done. And so the main thing that spouses can work best on is just saying, you know what, this is where we're at, and I need to just chill out. I need to, when he says that he's got three sons, I need to not correct them and say, no, there's a fourth. You always forget the fourth. You know, mm-hmm. let it go. It's, it's okay. It doesn't mean he forgot that he has four sons. It just means right now he's thinking about three of them, right? Or, you know, if you have to manage diets to, to kind of constantly say, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, it's, it ends up creating so much frustration within the relationship that in the end, half the things they're saying don't matter anyway, like if you take a step back. And so, yeah, I agree. I think that, that the more people are able to just say, you know what, that's not going to get done today, or okay, then he didn't remember something the way that he normally would have. Or, wow, look at how well he did today when he was in the garden. I wasn't expecting him to still be able to do that. Yeah, they're not usually these, like, grandiose things. They're usually just everyday things. And so when family members or loved ones are able to just recognize that, it makes their life a whole lot more simple. And like you said, it it, it actually will probably help them in the rest of their life to kind of just put things in perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, it's it's uh it's funny how all of a sudden you appreciate a smile or a giggle or somebody, you know, holding your hand or whatever, you know, like you said going to yeah. the soccer game or um reading a book or listening to somebody read a book or just being in their presence is it it takes a whole it takes on a whole new level. Um, of engagement and and I think one of the things too that um, that I you know I learned through this process was the levels the different levels of unconditional love you know I always mm-hmm. thought well you know it, there was one level but for me I found that there were many levels and and this mm-hmm. disease taught me to love deeper um, mm-hmm. and more completely and um, be less um, 
have less expectations, you know, going mm-hmm. in um, where I didn't even realize I had them before, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's it's very, very interesting. Um, what suggestions, uh, you know, what other suggestions do you have to help people kind of overcome these challenges? You talked about really living in the present, you know, staying focused and not getting pulled into the past by grief or, or pushed into the future, you know, and worrying of, of what's to come because we can't really control any of that. Um, mm-hmm. So what, what suggestions, what other suggestions do you, do you have that might be able to help family and friends? Um, I think the, the, the first one would be to just try to listen more. And you just touched on this a minute ago. Um, a lot of times we, um, we don't really take in what the person with dementia is saying, especially if they speak a lot less frequently or if their words kind of jumble together and so it doesn't um, it doesn't hold the same understanding for us that maybe it would have before the disease process. Um, and a lot of times, if, especially if there's somebody who may just kind of talk kind of, kind of nonstop and we just need, like, need a break from it. Um, but I think a lot of times what happens is in our mindset of thinking that we know best, we tend to just say, okay, yeah, 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 and kind of dismiss what they're saying and not really listen. And they're very aware that nobody has just listened to them. Um, it doesn't mean that they remember kind of later necessarily that somebody was ignoring them. But in the moment, they're very aware that nobody is really kind of taking in what they're saying. And the reality is they have a lot that they need to contribute. And so when I talk about speaking, it's not, not necessarily verbally, even though those are, those, are, those are the examples that I just gave, but non-verbally, they tell us so much. So they can tell us they're agitated or, you know, a look on their face may tell us, ooh, they look like they're uncomfortable right now or, you know, fidgeting with their clothes. Maybe it's a sign that they're uncomfortable in their clothes or they're hot or they're cold or they're constipated or something. And so the more that we're able to listen, the more that they're going to be able to contribute to the relationship because it's one of the ways that we have to work on ourselves. But in doing so, it opens up this whole avenue for them to be able to um, add to the, to the relationship. And so I think that the more people spend time working on that skill set, the more that they will benefit from it as well the person who has dementia. So I think that's a, a big one. Um, I think the other one would be to um, sort of set simple goals. Like so you and I have talked a little bit on this call about expectations and having no expectations. But at the same time, I think it's okay to say, because it can be hard to live entirely that way. And so I, I, I recommend to families, you know, why don't you come up with three goals of where you want to head? And it, this includes the person with dementia. So there's um, there's a little lady and, and um, her husband was very self-disciplined. And so when she started burning dishes, he immediately exercised his self-discipline over her, which didn't go very well. And so fast forward, I end up meeting with both of them. And when we got finished, I said to her, I said, so what are your goals? What would you like to do? And she said, well, you said I should exercise more. So I'm already playing tennis two days a week, so I'll, I'll play the third day um, when my when the ladies I play with ask me. She said, and, and you said that um, I need to be, I should be using my brain, so I like to read, but the books that I read are too big, so I'm going to borrow my brother's that are shorter. She said, you know, you, you said that socialization is really good for me. She said, you know, the thing is I'm I'm 85 years old. Most of my friends have moved. A lot of them have passed away. She said, and I've never been one to just go out and make friends. I've just not who I am. She said, so when the ladies that I play tennis with ask me to go to lunch with them, I'll go to lunch. And I said, that's rock solid. Perfect. Like those are, that's a great direction to head in. And her husband emailed me the next day and said, we're on a totally new journey. Like I never would have thought to ask her, you know, what it was that she wanted to do. And so it was just this reminder that like, not only do we need to ask, but we need to listen, and then we need to incorporate it because it goes back to what you said before, that sometimes what the changes are going to be can be very simple. Those are not mm-hmm. hard. They might go right in line with life and where it's already headed. Um, but it's also okay to say, okay, let's work toward this. You know, So maybe her husband's goal for her would have been to go to the gym five days a week. Well, she doesn't go to the gym, or, or his goal might have been you know, sign up someplace where she go makes new friends. Well, that's not her, and so – part of the reason we get frustrated when our expectations aren't met is because oftentimes we put the wrong expectations in place. 
And so yep. as we listen to people who have dementia, then we can we can actually put better goals in place. So sort of to overcome those challenges I was talking about before, those are kind of the best place to start. And there's something that you can apply to pretty much every situation you're going to walk into. Mm-hmm. It's more of a mindset than a than a how to. Yeah, one of uh, one of my good friends, Harry Urban, um, made a comment one time when he was at was either on Dementia Chats or the radio, um, but it it has stuck with me, and it gets to your point of having the wrong expectations. And you know, so many times we feel like we have to keep the person busy with dementia mm. all the time, you know, because it, and and we do that because it makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we're mm-hmm. do you know making an impact um but harry said just so so eloquently one day he's like you know i like to relax before i got dementia i still do <laughs> and so again it just it, he's like it's okay if i'm sitting outside smelling the flowers and soaking up the sun or relaxing right. in my recliner or whatever it is it's okay for mm-hmm. my body to slow down and just yeah. be and I and yeah. to me it was just a brilliant thing of of um, how we uh, you know our expectations um, don't always line up with their needs or wants. Yeah. And yeah. and it, and and again <laughs> the simplicity of it all because I do think um, as humans we just tend to complicate things. Um, and one of the yeah. things that I, frustrates me probably the most is seen um, in some facets where people want to make it complicated because then it's more controllable than, you know, there's more money to be made or there's more whatever. And it's like, no, this is really, you know, I have a whole different philosophy of simplicity and and making it easy and bringing people comfort because I don't think anybody needs more complicated in their life. I just, I, I think life, yeah. life's doing that. It's complicated doing enough, it, yeah. It is, yeah, with that, yeah. Um, you know, as a whole. Well, you know, in your book here, I've, I've just got it in front of me, and I'm just, uh, just going to kind of um, read a couple of, like, chapter titles so that people kind of get a feel for what it's all about. But, you know, in Chapter 1, you talk about controlling yourself, not the circumstances, which is, like, brilliant, you know, because we can't <laughs> control the circumstances. We, but we're brought up from young children to think that we can't, you know. Yeah. Um, and that's a real disjustice, I think, that adults do. And yeah. we really need to focus on ourselves. Um, and, you know, that's really the only way that we can find peace. And you talk about self-discipline and attitude and groundwork and, and possibilities. So many times we shut ourselves down on the possibilities because we're too busy trying to control it where brilliant things happen when we allow people to be who they are and utilize mm-hmm. their skills and their passions. And, um, and I think, um, You know, I think that there's a zillion stories in dementia where people say, well, I I never knew I never knew he could paint or I never knew Mm -hmm. that they like to sing or I never knew that they well, because we didn't allow it. We didn't we we didn't allow the possibility to happen. So um, chapter one, I think, is is really um, very fun. And then chapter two, you've got describing the brain with dementia. So it's, you know, really more um, defining it um, and the disease and then uh, chapter three is about putting your ducks in a row, um, being prepared, the legal documents, preparing for a move, um, building a team, crucial, crucial to, to get those supports in place. Chapter four, you talk about staying engaged and communicating um, with someone with dementia and encouraging that socialization, which might be outside of the box, um, mm-hmm. again, I think we many times go, well, no, they never did that. Well, did they want to? Did they have an opportunity Mm -hmm. to? Um, You know, I think it's all about, um, you know, changing those perceptions and, again, bringing joy and building on the possibilities. And, okay, well, let's try it. And it's not about Mm -hmm. being perfect anymore. You know, it's Mm -hmm. it's really about um, joy, finding joy and um, engaging people and making them feel purposeful. And then five is about creating meaningful time, you know, not just passing the time, um, which I think, 
can be uh, something people fall in a trap because they don't know what to do. When you talk about giving up control, small changes can bring big success. Um, talk about friends and meaningful activities. Um, then you go on to making the home a safe and supportive place, which is huge. And so you talk about calmness. You talk about memory centers, um, routines, home modifications, and, and then um, in Wrapping up in chapter seven, you have about, you know, okay, now you got to take care of yourself too. And you got to let go of the guilt and and make time for you. And, um, you know, where can a, where can a care partner, you know, go for help? So this book is loaded with tons of great, great information. And, um, you know, as Carrie had said, you don't have to read it all in one crack. You can just pick it up and, and um, grab a couple pages of it and digest it and, and then get out there and, and try a couple of things and um, and see what happens. What kind of response have you been getting from families from the book, Carrie? Um First of all, thank you for going through that. I, I, I was sitting there. I could have been taking notes listening to you. So, so then the book's already finished. Because you just recapped it really well. Um, so the feedback that we've, can, that we've been getting is overwhelmingly that it's just practical, helpful, and easy to read. I think those are the three words that come up in pretty much every piece of feedback we've, we've gotten. Um, people, are, people can relate to it. Um, I think a lot of families, you know, they, they say, oh, I know I have a little easy book that you can read. You know, I think it also gives, you know, if you're, if your friend, if you have a friend who has the disease or a friend's loved one that has the disease and you want to be able to help people are like, oh, this is something I can do, but it's also something that's really easy for the person who's receiving it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much been the feedback, just kind of overwhelmingly those same, those same three comments. There's a lot of people that have worked in the field for a long time or have been, you know, um, involved in this work for a long time, and all of them have even said, like, this is just one of the books we've been waiting for, you know, is this book, like I said in the beginning, that kind of just pulls everything together. It's the bridge between what we know in the healthcare field, those of us who are practiced in it every day, to meet the demands that, you know, Pop in the middle of Kansas has with has with his wife. You know, they're, they're – um, they're simple. They're they may be hard to put in practice based on you and who you are in your life, but it doesn't change the fact that they're simple. They're still simple um, suggestions. Um, because Jen, um, and with especially with all of her research background, you know, so much of this is all evidence based, and not just our perception of it, but you know, we've seen it, we've practiced it, we've worked it. You know, it's been coined as best practice, et cetera, et cetera. So for families, um, the professionals are saying, we're so excited that there's something we can now give to families. So there's doctor's offices that give them out, tons of um, nursing homes and assisted livings give them out to people who come through the door. Um, so, yeah, that's it's been really positive, all of the feedback. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, uh, you know, this is long overdue. So many people have been writing books and trying to get things out there. And it just really seems like in the last couple of years, there's really been a shift with things yeah. and um it's it's nice to it's nice to see you know with the the movie still alice and glenn campbell's mm. movie and um you know the, the raising of awareness you know you go back to to reagan you know um yeah. with with his issues with dimension you look at the difference and it's it's so significant yet Yet we yeah. still aren't even close to where we need to be in terms of resources mm -hmm. and, and connecting people um, with information right. there. Um, can yeah. you share with us what are some of the best ways that family can keep um, their loved ones with dementia um, involved in their own life? What are what are some things that they can do? Um, so I think... Um, in addition to letting them be part of um, their goals, <laughs> um, I think uh, one of them is, is making a schedule for the day and posting it so you can read about that sort of in the staying engaged chapter of the memory centers. Um, mm -hmm. The reason being that it, it allows the person with dementia to have some routine so they can then go look on the refrigerator and see what's going on for the day or um, – you know, know that this is the, their daughter's coming today, and so they can kind of have that sense of independence. Oh, okay, I know that that's what's going on. It doesn't mean they'll remember it, but if they get 
they as they get used to knowing where to find that information, it creates an independence in that way. Um, some of the other ways are just um, I, I strongly encourage fam- um, family members to tell the other people who are in that person's life. So if it's um, if they're still working, perhaps you know, letting the people at, at work know, you know, we're going through some challenges, um, just so that they can be sensitive to it. Or if it's um, neighbors or friends that come by regularly, a lot of family members um, and care partners will actually become quite isolated because they don't want the person who has dementia, they don't want their dignity to be affected or they want people to respect them still. And so they're afraid that they'll end up embarrassing themselves. And so what I often tell families is actually people already know. You know, you, mm-hmm. you think that you're protecting them from something, but these are people who love them and care about them. So they've, they've already noticed this. And so in order to avoid the care partner becoming isolated, but also then the person with dementia being isolated from these friends and, and other close relationships they have, is to just let the people know. It doesn't mean you have to give them the whole diagnosis, but to simply say, you know, my husband's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so it just means things are going to be different. But please still come by. You know, if you find old photos, send them to us when you're when you're in town. We'd still love to meet up with you for dinner or have you over for dinner if that's the option. So, so that the person with dementia doesn't end up losing out on all these relationships simply because the family is trying to protect them from something. Um, so I think these are, are some of the ways, you know, we, we want to protect them so badly, but in doing so, a lot of times we may end up pulling people out of their life very prematurely. Um, if somebody decides they don't want to be here, that's a different story. But, you know, if my sister comes to hang out with me, it's a whole lot different than when my friend comes to hang out or if I'm with, you know, my son. So it's important for me for me to stay involved in my own life to continue having those different types of relationships. Um, so I think that's another way that families can really encourage the person with dementia to be involved in their own life. Um, and, and then again, because I, I can't stress it enough, just listen to them. Ask them questions and listen. Um, you know, I think the gentleman that you said, you know, who said I like to relax before the disease and I like to relax after the disease, like, that takes a lot of pressure off of his wife to make him constantly doing something. And it allows mm-hmm. his life to be a whole lot nicer because he doesn't have somebody on his case all the time when he didn't like that probably for his 50 years of marriage. <laughs> yep. um, so that's why asking them and letting them be part of that is important because then we will naturally begin to do that. What do you want for dinner tonight? What would you like to wear today? Do you want to use the bathroom before we go out? It it becomes normal as opposed to this is what we're eating tonight because you have to be healthy. This is what you're wearing because it's the temperature outside. You have to go to the bathroom before we go because you're going to have an accident. It, it changes the way that you end up talking to a person if you're in the habit of regularly asking them questions and listening to what they have to say. So those are but they're, again, they may sound super simple, and I know it's, it takes life practice to change it, but well worth it on the other end, I promise. Yeah, I I definitely agree with you there. It's, it, you know, it's the the little things like you said that have just such a huge, huge impact. And until we become conscious on how we care, we can't even make that shift. You know, so we really have to slow down and listen to ourselves and and almost do an out of body watch ourselves in terms mm-hmm. of how yep. are we, you know how are we interacting and I think sometimes we'll be really surprised at what we see because yeah. um we can get caught up in that to do list um and when we look at a to do list and we see that it involves somebody else we we think it's all about being person centered um but mm-hmm. if emotionally. Mm-hmm. We aren't um, we aren't putting them first. Um, we can't truly right. be person centered. And so, right. you know, for me, that was a huge, huge shift. Um, was understanding my emotions behind the things I was doing, and um, and and understanding why I did what I did. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, care partners do things out of guilt, um, yeah. or they do things yeah. out of expectation. Um, you know, yeah. knowing other people are watching and, and those aren't good motivators. I mean, is that how, right. is that how, how we would want to be cared? Would we want somebody there because they felt guilty or they felt bad for us or um, they were just doing it um, for show? No, we want right. someone who's who's authentic to be present with us. So why should we give any less to somebody else, um, right. especially right. somebody's and, love? Right. And in doing so, like you said, 
it will actually make your life easier. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a, a huge component because if you're completely stressed out, well, then you're going to be, you know, short fused and get upset and these normal things that we often see. Whereas to your point, you know, the list, you look at the list of things that have to get done. And so it looks like this is all about him, but in the end they may not even be things that he wants or needs. And so you put that pressure on yourself that you, that mm-hmm. is a good thing because you have the total control to, to take it off. Yep. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think sometimes we don't realize we have the control to take it off though. You know, when yeah, we're looking right. at, when we're looking at things and, and again, um, you know, really realizing, um, I, I think from a personal standpoint too, you know, and it gets kind of probably to your last chapter of taking care of yourself, but you know, what brings you joy? Is it, is it mm-hmm. truly controlling somebody else or is it sharing a laugh or a hug? You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, how do you want to be present? Do you want to be um, kind of stiff and in control and, you know, looked at like Nurse Ratchet or a sergeant? Or <laughs> or do you just want to be that compassionate, loving, you know, friend or husband mm-hmm. or wife or daughter or child? You know, who do you yeah. who do you really want to be? And yeah. um, a lot of times we don't we don't think that deeply about how we care um, because of standards and expectations but i i think it's something that we really need to discuss more um Mm -hmm. and look at our roles and how how we want to be treated and how we react and and keeping in mind that most of us don't like others doing stuff for us because it makes Mm -hmm. us feel incompetent and so you know if we keep that in mind when we're caring for someone else it it can really shift how we care Yeah, you know. definitely. Well said. Yeah. So, well, well, we're almost to our our end of our hour. Any any last minute tips or things that you wanna wanna tell people at all, Carrie? Um, I think just as much as you're able, see that there's there's always the other side. So there are good things waiting and I know it may not seem it. And I might, I know that it may seem really difficult, but this disease, I have listened to so many families just talk about how it's changed their loved ones. So there's one woman who had an ideal marriage according to the world standard. And, and she said it wasn't, and if you ask her today, five years after her husband passed away, if you ask her, you know, when you think of your husband, what do you think of? She said, I think of those last three years when he had Alzheimer's disease, she said, because he couldn't do all the things he had ever done. She said, and it was only then that I learned how to just sit still and be with him. And Mm -hmm. so it's kind of just this reminder, like it will bring you back to what really matters. And, and I know that it may sound hokey or emotional, but it's actually really true because like Lori said before, it will really help you get to that, ability to have a deeper relationship that a lot of people miss out on. And I think given the world that we live in today and the speed at which it moves and the information that's thrown at us, it makes it harder to do those things. And yet it's really what's most satisfying at the end of the day. So if you're frustrated right now, if you're having guilt, if you're just wondering if any of this is possible, I would say just take it one day at a time, chew off a little bit at a time and put it into practice and see your own success. I tell people all the time, seeing is believing. So the more times you see, whoa, this is working for me, then the more that you'll believe it and so the more that you'll continue to naturally do it. But it's a way of thinking and so that can't change overnight. So don't beat yourself up, but just recognize that it is going to take time to be able to to see all of this happen, but well worth it on the other side. So I just encourage you. It's not an easy job. Nobody's saying that, but it's definitely one that has a lot of a lot of gold in the midst of it if if you're able to uncover it and be willing to see it. So um, thank you, Lori, for having me on your show. I love what you do. I think it's um, a a huge resource to everybody who is um, trying to care for somebody or people who have the disease themselves. I think um, what you're doing is absolutely fantastic. So thank you, and just I encourage you to keep going with it. Oh, 
Well, thank you. This has just been a, a pleasure chatting with you today. Um, if you'd like to get a hold of, of Carrie Mills, you can go to her website, engagingalzheimers.com. And on there, you can also um, buy her book, I Care, um, a handbook for par- uh, care partners of people with dementia. And one of the things that's nice, too, is, you know, if you buy in bulk, um, there's discounts there for, for the book, which is kind of cool. So this is a book that uh, you might want to just buy a few of them for the family, or uh, maybe you've got a, a friend who is dealing with this, or maybe you know um, this book could be helpful at your library and you want to donate it. Uh, there's you know, There's just not enough of this information out there guys and so the more information we can we can get out uh, to the public and in their hands uh, the better the better they can do that you can also uh, call uh, Carrie at 914-964-0997 that's 914-962-0997 um, or email her at Carrie, and that's K E R R Y at engagingalzheimers.com. Again, just a such a pleasure to have you on the show. I wish you brilliant success um, with your book and uh, speaking and coaching that you do. Um, thank you so much for all you do, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, and I hope you all have a great day. Okay. Bye now. Um, Bye. Well, what a, what a very fun conversation uh, to have with Carrie Mills. Uh, just a, a, a brilliant little light um, in the arena of, of Alzheimer's and dementia. Um, wonderful resources, again, that you will find um, on her website, engagingalzheimers.com. And again, the book is called I Care, a Handbook for Care Partners for People with Dementia. Before I let you all go today, I do want to just remind you that our last radio show, was about um, health clubs for people with dementia, uh, something that is just rolling out up in Canada. I would love to see it franchised and uh, grow everywhere, along with products for those dealing with Alzheimer's and other types of dementia by a company called Fit Kits. Our next uh, show next Tuesday is going to be a two-hour special, and we are going to be talking about frontal temporal lobe dementia. We will have uh, the association there. We're going to have a business that's doing something kind of special with it. We're going to be talking with people that have uh, FTD as well as those that are caring for them, and we would encourage you, like always, to be part of that, um, part of of the show by calling in or participating through the chat box. Um, Our last Dementia Chats uh, was on the 10th, and at that time we discussed the movie Still Alice and our disappointment that the movie wasn't uh, in the theaters all over. I just actually got an email here shortly that says um, they think it's now in more theaters, so apparently the word has gotten out or the plan has taken place. I'm not sure which, um, but would really encourage people to go out and see the movie Still Alice. Um, you'll probably have a, an opinion, good or bad. It doesn't make any difference. This is about awareness uh, I think the movie was done uh, very well. Again, in the time frame they have, they can't cover everything. Um, but, uh, you know, kudos kudos to the theaters for taking this up. Uh, we also talked about um, the G7 meeting. Uh, Michael Allen Bogan was uh, listening in and kind of filled us in on, on a little bit there. And we also had Harry Urban on uh, with us, and he talked about his movement, United Against Dementia. Um, Both just had great tips um, on how to help people with dementia when out in the community as well. Our next Dementia Chats will be February 24th. That will be at 3 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Central, 1 Mountain Time, and that's noon Pacific or 8 o'clock if you're over in London. And those webinars, of course, are free. And we would love you to participate. Our experts, again, on dementia chats are those living with the disease. And we really don't have any uh, 
planned agenda. We really go with the flow and where our community wants to wants to uh, lead us. Um, on the blog, there is the post for the recorded dementia chat. So again, um, those are all listed. If you go to alzheimerspeaks.com, go to our about page, uh, and then click on dementia chats. Uh, past uh, the past sessions are all listed there. There was also um, a blog post that I did about uh, on Valentine's Day about love is all around us, just waiting for us to find it. Sometimes when we're dealing with chronic illness, we forget. Um, we just plain forget um, the the love that can kind of carry us through and the support that is out there. So. Um, today, I don't have a second guest. I'd be more than glad to stay on the line. If anybody has any questions or comments, I'll hang out here for, for just a minute. Otherwise, again, I would encourage people to go ahead and uh, be part of the Purple Angel Program, which is the new global symbol for dementia. And you can, again, find that on alzheimerspeaks.com, going to our About page and clicking on the Purple Angel um, this is a movement that started over in the U.K., and Alzheimer Speaks is the U.S. launch pad for that. Um, but if you happen to be listening from anywhere around the world, go ahead and click on that, um, and I will, uh, I'll connect you with Norms and Jane um, for the information in other countries as well. If you're in Minnesota, uh, check out uh, HealthStar Home Health if you're looking for a home health care uh, company. Uh, they just do a marvelous job in terms of dealing with dementia. And if you're looking for an Alzheimer's Association anywhere in the world, check out Alzheimer's Disease International. Uh, they'll be able to help you out. There's also some great research and global perspective that you will find on that website. Uh, for a holistic approach, uh, go to Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation. There you'll find information on diet, exercise, and meditation. And if you're dealing with uh, Lewy body dementia, there is an organization specifically for that. Same with frontal temporal lobe dementia. Um, and again, re reminding people that next week we will have a two-hour special talking about frontal temporal lobe dementia. Um, just love the brilliance of, of everybody coming together and working collaboratively uh, for dementia and, and helping people live brilliant, full lives. So thank you all so much. We'll talk to you next week and um, appreciate you uh, sharing and liking not only our episodes, but all the work we do on Alzheimer's Speaks as well. Um, through our connections, we will make a difference uh, to so many people in their lives. Have a brilliant week. Bye now. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesti, your host of Retire Repurposed. This podcast is dedicated to help people transition into fulfilling and purposeful retirements. Retirement is a big life change. In fact, the two most dangerous years of a person's life are the year they were born and the year they retire. Few people could just flip the switch from working a career 30 or 40 plus years retiring on Friday without methodical steps to living what we call a repurposed retirement. To listen now, search Retire Repurpose on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.